Are you ready to become awesomer? Hello everyone, this is Umar Hamid, your host, and welcome to the No Limit Selling Podcast, where industry leaders share their tips, strategies, and advice on how to make you better, stronger, faster. Get ready for another episode. Hello, everyone. I'm really privileged today to have uh, Pete Arnott here with me. And Pete is a copywriter, and he does this amazingly powerful trick. You know, any salesperson in a sales situation can uh, read their customer and say the right things and land the sale, but Pete does it through the written word. And so he has to be an extraordinary salesperson to get people to go, oh my God. I want to do this, open up their wallet and make it happen. Pete, welcome to the program. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you for having me and thank you for that introduction. My pleasure. One of the things that's really interesting is, uh, you know, we all struggled in English class, at least I did. And it was like, you know, what's the point of it? And it turns out that writing is so critical when we realize that uh, we have the power to emotionally move people, it's not just the Shakespeare's of the world, but if we think it through, we can we can change things in significant ways. Yeah, I mean, when you understand that, it's I think all copywriters have this weird feeling at some point when they have some success where they realize that just by putting some words down on a page or writing a script for somebody to s- someone to speak you can actually convince people to spend thousands tens of thousands of dollars and you kind of get this little uh, weird feeling of influence so you you do have to be careful with it but it's uh, it's fun at the same time and i mean i completely flopped english just going back to that i was a disaster at it i love books i've always loved reading but what they teach you in school did not help me in the slightest with this. What's interesting is in my high school career, the only book I ever read through the entire high school experience was Catcher in the Rye. The reason I liked it was because it was written in the ver- first book I ever came across that was written in a conversational style. Mm. And everything else I just eavesdropped in class just to uh, get enough to get a C. But as soon as I left high school and people stopped telling me I had to read, I became like a ravenous reader and I've been that way ever since. Yeah, I mean, that's a funny point that you mentioned there, that it was the conversational style that brought you in, because like one of the fundamentals of persuasion is just that conversational style, particularly when it comes to copywriting. It's just you're not attempting to sound highfalutin, you're not using big $2 words when a five-cent word would work. It's just that conversational style that actually gets people to move. Absolutely. It's, it's, it makes it relatable. And and the idea, I think, sometimes uh, that people get in their head in, in writing is that I need to look good and I need to portray this image. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's about the reader. How can I connect with them in a way that they feel moved, whether you're selling something or just communicating an idea or whatever. And it's so easy to be egocentric. It's all about me looking good, as opposed to the person that we're sending it to. I mean, that's exactly what it is. And that's honestly something I still struggle with is I spend all this time writing something that I think is excellent, but you go back and you look at it and you realize it's all just you attempting to sound good or you attempting to show your own skills when it doesn't actually come down to the one thing that matters, which is just telling your prospect what they need to hear to turn them into a customer or a lead or whatever it is, whatever that action is you have to take. And it's such a common mistake. It's it's tough to overcome. One point in your career, you were helping authors and keynote speakers build their businesses more uh, rapidly and probably more strategically through the written word. Yeah. So what we did was I worked at an agency where I was handling all the marketing for it. And what we did was we targeted non-fiction authors, so self-development, business owners, coaches, whatever it was. We targeted these people and the whole positioning was, well, it started out and then the company changed. So it started out with we would just help them take their book that they'd been writing because it turned out this was kind of during the self-publishing boom where everybody was writing books and we just said we'll help you launch 
we'll help you publish and launch these books and we'll get it in front of thousands of people. We'll sell thousands of copies and it's going to be this awesome credibility booster, this awesome way for you to connect with your customers, build a relationship, etc. But we quickly found out that when you use this, if we use the book at the beginning of the funnel, at the front of the funnel, we realized that we could actually use this book and then use that as a way to bring the person, bring the prospect into the author's universe and then use it to sell high ticket services. So we were able to take people who were maybe selling a book for $10 and turn those into $1,000 sales, $5,000 sales, $10,000 sales, just it all started with that book. And happy to go into this as much as you want. We're going to go deeper into that in a minute. But the interesting part is this, is that uh, I would suspect many of the authors that had written a book were also public speakers that were doing presentations about their you know area of expertise. And so these people know how to communicate. Oh, yeah. And they know how to connect with an audience. And yet their ability to write and turn that intellectual property into a business was uh, was challenging because it's a different style of writing uh, when you're trying to write copy that sells. Yeah, I mean, and the inverse of that is copywriters tend to be pretty bad speakers and quite often awful salespeople in person. And I count myself as one of them it's they're just completely inverse skills and as you say the speakers are sometimes absolutely electric on stage or one-on-one with somebody but when it comes to write an email or a sales letter or a book anything it's just a completely different skill and they can't communicate the same way that they can they that they can via the spoken word I'm not sure if you have this uh, challenge Pete but but I do sometimes I get this notion in my head I can do it myself. (laughs) It's true. I can do it myself badly, but it takes a while to figure out that, no, no, I need somebody that's an expert in this area because it's not just as simple as doing the the task at hand. It's doing it well to get the outcome you want. And so our ego often, at least my ego, often gets in the way of me actually accomplishing powerful things because of that illusion that I'm really smart. Yeah. And it's, I mean... I think a lot of that comes down to just fear of letting go and fear of letting someone else do it. But if you can realize that letting someone else do it is just going to give you exponential results as opposed to you attempting to figure that out yourself and then do it poorly or what most likely is going to happen is you just put it off and never do it at all. Yep, that is the enemy. Someday I'll get to it. So why don't we go deeper into this, you know, helping authors. So the first thing you guys did was say, okay, we're going to offer their book up, uh, probably advertise it. And then how did you advertise it? And how did you find the target to advertise it to? So a couple of different ways. First of all, usually when the business owner was coming to us, they had a particular they had a particular goal in mind. So they said, I'm going to write this book about, let's say, public speaking. And the goal with this is just to position me as more of an expert in public speaking. So what we would do is we'd work with them to get the book done. And then whatever the client's audience or prospect was that they went to go after, they wanted to go after, we tended to do a couple of things. Uh, mostly focused on affiliates and paid advertising. So we'd go out and we'd find affiliates who would be willing to promote this to their audience that matched up with the target audience. And of course, paid advertising was and is still the same. You just have to be willing to put money into it and target the correct people. So the targeting and finding of the people wasn't the particularly difficult part because the universe is huge for almost any niche which uh, medium did you use to advertise it was it uh google facebook combination oh, almost always facebook ads so what did a typical ad look like you know i buy this book and become uh, more attractive to the opposite sex like what was the general kind of i guess depending <sighs> on the topic yeah so it depended on the topic but usually what we would do is we'd just target it 
towards again this was easier because it was non-fiction books but what we would do is let's say the book was something about how to make money or grow your business all all we really did was have to take some of the core concepts out of that book sometimes it was simple as simple as taking the title of the book uh, and then we just push ads push ads that were going to a landing page with these sorts of promises on them and it would either go to a landing page that made a direct sale or what we would do and this is when we transitioned to selling the high ticket services what we would do is we'd actually just offer to give away the book for nothing. So the funnel became an ad that would say, get your free copy of this book. They would opt into that funnel. And then from that funnel, we would send them a PDF copy of the book. We would give them the option to buy the physical copy if they wanted, but we would give them the PDF version of the book. And in that That's funnel, we'd, in, and we'd invite them to a live webinar or just push them to an online sales letter that would then take them to the next step so it's like okay now you've read the book like here's a bonus here's a bonus master class on a uh, how to take your business to seven figures and they'd be invited to that and they've obviously by the time we invited them they had They'd uh, usually had the book for maybe a week or two. They'd had constant communication from the author via email campaigns. And by that point, they were they were much more ingratiated with the author and his concepts so that when they came onto that webinar, they were hot prospects and it just made selling them whatever it was much easier. So that's kind of what the secret was. It was front-loading all that value uh, and just given that educational value building series before we got them on the webinar. So instead of having the typical 45 to 60 minutes to make a sale, we had maybe a one to two week period that would be finalized and capped off by that one webinar. Okay. So how many touches from uh, them saying, I want this book to get the PDF to when you did the webinar, how many touches did you do and what kind of time frame? It was usually it it was usually about seven to fourteen days, and within that, you would have emails going out either every day or every second day. And towards the towards the date of the webinar, it tended to get a little bit more intense. So we might have we might start moving to two emails a day in the last few days, just to constantly remind them that this is coming up and it's something they can't afford to miss, and they've got to be there because. We're going to share all this value and all these secrets. So it changed, but it was, I mean, the ideal situation if you're doing this is daily communication. Just sometimes we couldn't do that because of uh, the amount of time that we had available. Sorry, not time, the amount of bandwidth that we had available. Uh, But then after that, they didn't always buy on the webinar, which is just normal. So what we would then have is a post-webinar sequence where you now change the conversation to all be focused on the product and why they need to buy it. So you've done the maybe one to two weeks of value building, you've made the pitch. And then after that, it became the maybe five days of, hey, this is awesome. You need to buy it because we're taking it off the table and just sort of restating all the benefits and what's in it for them and just pushing that sale. And so was this like products they created all in a can ready to go? So basically nothing the author had to do afterwards, just make the sale and it kind of automatically delivered the course or whatever? Yeah, 90% of the time that was the case because again, these these authors tended to be business owners before or entrepreneurs or business owners or service providers before they came up with the idea to have a book. So they tended to have various products and services already and what they wanted the book for yes. was a positioning and credibility piece that they they thought would just be a good sort of marketing asset but then what we were able to do is say actually no we'll take this book and we'll make it the lead gen piece to your funnel and it was just a way to sort of they that would have most likely happened anyway because over time people would have picked up the book and then naturally they would find out more about the author and they'd go to the website and we just kind of compressed that time frame down and built it into a system that they could use to you take a book and turn it into 
multiple six figures uh, within sort of a one to two week period. Brilliant. Thank you for kind of guiding us through that process, Pete. Uh, I'm going to change kind of direction in the conversation. As a speaker, because uh, I've spoken in 14 countries, what's this? Uh, an old saying, you're always a bum in your hometown. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, when I go across country or across the world to speak, I'm seen like a hero. But when I speak in Baltimore, Maryland, it's like, oh, yeah, this is a local guy. How good could he be? So the reason I kind of frame it up is most of your business as a, a copywriter, you're in Scotland right now. Um, which city? Glasgow. Glasgow. And by the way, yep. is that the capital or just the main city? It is not the capital, unfortunately. Uh, Edinburgh is the capital, or as you Yanks tend to say, Edinburgh. So they've got the castle. Yep. That's where all the tourists go. But Glasgow is the it's the more populous city. The hub. And yeah, it's the hub. One of the things you had told me is that uh, most of your clients are stateside. Why do you think that is? Because certainly they sell digital products in the UK. But why do you think uh, you found more of a home work-wise in the US than uh, in Scotland, in England? A couple of, there's a couple of things. So the US is a bigger market, obviously. it's I mean, US is, what, 300 plus million, and the UK is a tiny fraction of that. So there's a bigger pond. Yes. There's, more, there's a lot more business going on. Americans also tend to have a much more... How should I say it? It's more of a positive get up and go, go get them attitude towards business. I would say there's a lot more people who are looking to better themselves, whether that's lose weight, get more chicks, grow their business. There's just kind of that mentality in the US, which I love, which is the sort of betterment of yourself and your business. Whereas in the UK, it can sometimes yes. be, it's not that we don't want these things because all humans want the same things. It's, you don't really talk about it as much. You, it's you're less likely to go and buy an expensive program or service for this because there's a sort of stigma around it in the UK. Uh, so I would say that's some of the main things. And then it's also just because because all the clients are there, the businesses tend to be there, and. I just go where the money is, and the money is over there. There's a famous guy in the U.S. from U.S. history called Dillinger. He was a bank robber. Mm -hmm. And then when they asked him, you know, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. <laughs> uh, take the Beatles, for example. No one can understand what the frick they're saying, but when they sing, they lose their, their accent. So when you write, you write in a way that connects with your audience in the U.S. Do you have to be mindful of that to write in American English? Like, is there a difference between how you would write for the British market versus the US market? Or does it uh, does American writing cross over into the, the UK and the UK may not cross over into the US? So I would think less, I tend to think less about the actual writing style. Of course, I do have to write in American English as opposed to old school English, let's call it. But for me, that's just kind of, because I've been doing this for so long, that's just natural to me. And a lot of my vocabulary and the day-to-day -day life tends to actually be more American. So words like awesome, which I've said multiple times already, apartment, just instead of flat, like simple things like this, real estate agent as opposed yes. to, like I tend to just speak that way anyway because I have to uh, and I've just taught myself to, but the writing style doesn't really matter as much. It's more the emotions you hit and the psychology that you're deploying when you're writing, that's what makes somebody that's what makes somebody get up and take action. Because like a perfect example, if I have if I had a product that is going to solve your biggest pain point ever and it guarantees it, it's going to do it instantly and there's absolutely no way that it can fail and I'm willing to give it to you. I could deliver that message in any way to you and you're going to accept it because it solves that pain for you. It gives you exactly what you need in the deepest level. So it doesn't actually matter. Right. The words don't matter that much. And sometimes I let those grammatical mistakes in my copy and things like that. It doesn't really matter as long as you're hitting those key emotional elements and you're giving them what they want or at least a way to get what they want.
Pete, uh, before we part company today, uh, probably the toughest question or the most challenging thing for folks is uh, stepping into their customer's world. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we have those basic human needs, but we still need to kind of get into the headspace of our uh, customers. So how do you manage to do that? Do you do it through trial and error or do you do interviews? Like how do you step in? Because oftentimes you work with clients that are selling different things. How do you step into the world of their end user? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's kind of the fundamental question when it comes to success as a copywriter. So to give you a perspective, my audience tends to be people buying financial services. That's what it is these days in the US and they tend to be Republicans slash conservatives who are 50 years or older and I'm a 30 year old guy from Scotland so it's about as far away as you get from that. I've also written for women, female markets, all these bizarre things that you would never think even exist but all it comes down to is just taking the time to understand who they are and what makes them tick and luckily it's relatively easy to do now if you're just willing to put in the work so I mean I can give you a couple of examples. Please, if you can give me some examples, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, so I mean, let's say you wanted to write for a female weight loss product. Let's just make that up. What I would do is I'd go to Amazon. I'd start looking at supplements, books, and similar products within that niche. And I'd go to the reviews and I'd go and I'd start reading to see what these people are saying about all different products, I'd get a feel for the language they use, the pains they have, the desires they have. I would just spend hours going through all these reviews and just getting a feel for how they speak. I would then go and look at various forums and blogs all over the internet. And again, I just spend time reading what they're saying, digesting the language they use, understanding all their pains and desires, seeing where their frustrations are. And I just keep doing that, keep doing that. Of course. If you can get someone on the phone, that's great, and you can interview them. But all this stuff's out there if you're just willing to spend some time and do it. And then so, after that, after that, I just tend to plan out in quite excruciating detail as much as I think I know about the customer. So I go into I go into all the pains they have. I go into all the desires they have. I go into confirming their suspicions. I go into how I'll alleviate the failures that I know they've had and then I go into like finding out who they believe the enemy is to their problem or desire and I just break this all down into huge documents that just lets me understand them. So are you building those documents as you're doing your research like capturing phrases and copying verbatim as you go or do you absorb everything and then create this master document? It's uh, ongoing so I don't I do it bit by bit. So as I'm researching, I'm pulling out words and phrases and just dumping them in a document so that I've got them stored. And I just keep doing that for a few days. Pete, certainly we saved the uh, the best part of the interview for the last. So I'm going to put this in the show notes. You know, make sure you stay till the end because I think that ability to go into Amazon, read the reviews, go into blogs, and just spend some quality time in the psyche of your target is something most people would overlook. And if they did research, it would be like a half hour on the internet and then, okay, we're ready to go. And I think that uh, with all things, it's amazing. Like when you work hard at something, you can get good at it. If you go beyond that, then you get so good that you make it look easy. If that makes any sense. Like you go into that flow state. Thank you so much for uh, being on the podcast today. I learned a lot. I really appreciate your craft. And certainly uh, I took uh, notes as we were talking to figure out how to put into action what we chatted about. Excellent. It's been great being here and I appreciate it. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your evening in uh, Scotland. And we're (laughs) just starting our day here in Baltimore. Thanks so much. Awesome chatting. Talk to you soon. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. And if you're looking for more tools, go to my website at nolimitselling.com. I've got a free 
mind training course there that's going to teach you some insights from the world of neuro-linguistic programming and that is the fastest way to get better results.